Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to yet another episode. I'm very happy to have Professor Jeff Horseman back on the show. He's written a couple more articles for the Empowered Substack. I highly recommend that you check out these articles because um, I think Jeff is extremely well knowledgeable and he obviously reached, researched a lot. And uh, these articles are so good that I really wanted to jump on this quick video podcast call with him so we can go through his articles um, and just to give a little bit of background information. Jeff, it's a pleasure to see you again. Thank you very much, David. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, I really appreciate all the hard work that you do. Uh, I really enjoy reading these articles and uh, I wanted to get started off. Uh, This is part two of a series that you've done. Uh, So you called it Living by Lies, part two, The Receipts. And it's, uh, you basically filed a freedom of information request uh, so you can see the claims that Director G1 has made in regards to basically people wanting to commit self-harm uh, due to speech at school. Um, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about it. Let me know how this FOI process went through and what did you find out? Sure. So quick background, of course, is that this was from um, Cindy Watson's motion looking for uh, instances of uh, where CRT and white privilege were taught. And of course, Director Chanaka refuted um, this motion uh, based uh, a large part on this emotional um, testimony he gave in a meeting saying that there was a lot of increased threats of violence and crucially he said the police had been involved several times right so that was something that is actually verifiable we can actually check with the police themselves and this is actually an extra advantage because we don't rely on uh, the school board dealing with them on freedom of information Uh, we've got a a lot of recent requests that have been very sketchy Um, i think we're going to work on some investigations dealing what exactly is happening with the foi process but the, the, the police system, the police services, the WRPS, the Waterloo Region Police Services, are independent. And so you can actually get a lot of good information through the request. So the idea was that we, he said there's been an increased, he said there have been, the police have been involved due to Watson's motion. It was the whole point of his, his speech was because of the motion. So this is something you can, you can check very easily. Um, So I I filed the Freedom of Information request with the police services looking for threats to schools and I also asked for threats involve the board office because that would be involving him or senior administrators. Uh, Any evidence that the police could could have that they had been called uh, to deal with anything like this. Um, and uh, the freedom of information uh, process went fairly well. I mean, it was it takes time, right? Because you you file something, uh, then they respond, and then often they'll follow with email or phone calls t- to better understand what you're looking for. And actually, they were really helpful. I found them extremely good to deal with. Um, it just you know they there's one person <laughs> dealing with these requests, or you know, so it takes some time. Um, but eventually I got the information um, and, you know, I asked for it in a sort of a tabular form so you could see by date how many incidences and what was the nature of the incidents. So most of the incidences in these schools are student on student. So it's very rare that they're involved staff members. Now, I think that's important to consider because if it, if the allegation is that the motion has got members of the public so upset that now they're threatening schools those are not likely going to be student on student I would suggest I I, I don't know how many students pay attention to these policy motions that are pretty dry I don't think they're tuning into board meetings but I you know maybe they are but I'm making the assumption here that that this is that the allegation probably what we're, we're concerned with here is the concern is that these motions are motivating uh, bigoted parents to make physical threats against uh, principals, teachers, senior administrators, etc. 
So what you'd want to know is, uh, has the rate of threats changed prior to Trustee Watson's motion relative to, I think, two or three week period following the motion uh, ending at the point where G1 made his statement saying that in fact there has been an increase in threats. And so, um, so I just plotted that data, x-axis date, you know, and then the threats based on student on student versus against trustee. And also the other thing that was noted was whether those, those were, had any basis. Many of them are empty threats. So the police, they have a code. I can't, they, I can't remember what it is, but they told me it means that it was uh, without merit or basically means the threat didn't happen is what they told me on the, on the phone. And many of them are like that. So, but if you go through and you try to calculate a rate, a time adjusted rate, how many threats per day, uh, I couldn't find any, I mean, certainly not statistically significant because we're looking, dealing with relatively few threats at a narrow window of time in that three weeks. I couldn't, there's no evidence that they changed from the period yeah. before to after. But, so it's just- So I so, looked, yeah. yeah. I looked at this article over here and I looked at the receipts because you have it laid out pretty nicely. Um, and you have a couple graphs over here. And it seems to me, basically, the summary is that you put in the request and it turned out, from what I can see, that the director was at best exaggerating, being dramatic, or straight up lying about what's happening in order to manipulate the public mm -hmm. or to get a reaction or mm -hmm. to get something um, going for him. Um, you know, like whether it's stopping a motion from going through, et cetera. And this is this is the conclusion from the evidence that I've seen that you provided is that it's unsubstantiated and that at this point, you know, if a director is just making claims of self harm and everybody's just sitting there and nobody bats an eye, nobody's like, Really? Can I see this? Like we we gotta involve the police. Those reactions are not happening. I don't think this is real. I think this is just smoke in the mirrors that's the most likely explanation i'm trying to be charitable right i'm trying to say okay maybe there's another explanation right? maybe there's something else we don't know so i actually did reach out to director chanica and his executive assistant uh, or another staff member responded to me asking oh can you clarify what you're exactly talking about i respond i never heard back so i you know kind of want to you can explain it to me because i you know maybe i'm just missing something here um but they haven't responded so I, you know, you could take of that what you will. Yeah, well, I do appreciate you being charitable on this one. Obviously, uh, I don't really give anything to the director that he doesn't uh, that he doesn't earn, and certainly to make a claim like this, he has not earned that claim. And uh, this is not the first time, from my experience, that I've seen him uh, make claims uh, like these. So, yeah, I thought it was very interesting just to see the evidence of this. And one of the things, here's a, here's a quote over here uh, from your article from R.D. Lang. They said, they're playing a game. They are playing at not playing a game. If I show them, I see they are, I shall break the rules and they will punish me. I must play their game of not seeing, I see the game. In other words, they would like us to continue pretending to not notice any gap between expected and observed behaviors. But what happens if we assume that they are telling the truth and we then act accordingly? So, you know, this is the problem over here. I think your article summarized it. There's a gap between the claims and reality, you know, and it's, I think it's really easy to make claims, right? And like for you to put in the freedom of information request, that takes time. So for somebody to say a lie, you know, it takes less than one second, but then mm -hmm. for somebody to prove that lie wrong, um, you know, it could take weeks, months, if they ever wanna release that information. And I think that's really telling, in my opinion, the fact that you're not getting very many answers from him uh, in this regard, because yeah, I, I think uh, I think everybody knows the answers, including himself. Caught in a lie. 
Yeah, and this is what's what is uh, also con disturbing is that we used to have, I think, a liberal society that would that would value the presumption of innocence, right? So you would have to assume people were innocent until proven guilty, and you would have to have evidence if you were going to make a stain uh, a claim against someone, and you would have to be very careful to say allegedly, you know, these sorts of things. But now we have government officials like this is a municipal government they have some power over us and our children and our education they are making very very dangerous statements about violence happening and and providing no evidence to support it and that's being used politically to affect policy and shut down certain motions and stop information from getting to parents this is deeply concerning and i think we all need to as you say i think it's it's a lot of work to do this, but I actually think we have to make sure that, I mean, if everyone just said, okay, no, I'm not gonna accept this little lie, I, I want you to explain it and just insist on that. And we keep doing that. That's how, at least one way that we can beat this back. Yeah, I completely agree. And for all the viewers and listeners, uh, I'm gonna be posting a link in the description to this article. And I just wanted to talk about the next article that you written, Jeff. It's called uh, Waterloo District School Board It Doubles Down. And once again, this article is about the director. And he said the director's November 13th statement revealed contempt for both parents and liberal democracy. And restoring the board's credibility must begin with his resignation. So I wanted to talk to you about what this article is about and what happened and how they ended up doubling down. So let's start from the beginning, just really quick, just so people can get up to speed. Yeah, so this is referring to the September 20th protests, the Million March for Kids, which was Canada-wide. Um, and uh, on September 19th, the WRDSB issued a statement on their website, unsigned, but uh, it was quite a disturbing statement because it said some of the motivations behind these protests are hate and um, what was it, sort of ignorance about what's happening in school, misinformation or something like that, misunderstanding. Um, so this is very serious to suggest that the parents are hateful. This is a motivation. They're saying some of the motivations, but you know that's a very dangerous thing to say because what it does is it is it really is designed to make people fearful of being associated with it. Right? Now, that didn't seem to work because there was a very big turnout. Um, but uh, a group of us got together and wrote a letter to uh, to the board, to uh, Director Chanica directly, and we copied all the trustees as well as his executive assistant. Um, and we we took issue with this letter. We, you know, we said this is this is unbecoming of a director. This is very divisive. Uh, you have no evidence for this. You're prejudging something. Um, so uh, we, we said that I, I think this is something you should retract and apologize for. Um, now, we never got any response from that. But what happened is that later, I believe, uh, trustee Cindy Watson brought this up and said, are we planning to respond to this letter? It was sent from uh, our group, Empower, uh, Educating Minds, Parents of Water Region, as well as uh, a Kitchener Muslim Association, I believe, also sent. I think it might have been the same letter. I think, um, I'm not sure if it was changed a bit or, or not, but um, so those two letters, um, and when Trustee Watson brought this up, uh, the director suggested that he, he didn't know anything about this. You know, it was sent to him, copy to his assistant, all the trustees. Uh, he kind of now, I don't know if he just forgot. Um, again, he that's a charitable forget. interpretation. <laughs> but he said, oh, I don't know. If, maybe if I had this, you know, if I, you know, if I had known ahead of time, I could respond. And then the next meeting, or shortly after, November 13th, committee of the whole meeting, he did respond. Uh, quite a lengthy response. Um, so, you know, I'll give him his, his due. I, I think that's, I'm glad that he did respond. Um, and he, it was probably a, uh, quite lengthy he read he read from a letter responding point by point to our letter um, and so uh, but that that response uh, did not contain any any um, 
any apology, any admission that they'd made a mistake, but it was doubling down. Um, and I think, for example, our criticism of the their statement was that there was no evidence that there was any hate. So in, in his response, he provided evidence, and the evidence was, uh, well, not from any Kitchener organizers, it was from, I think, the the National Million March for Kids website, which none of us wrote. wrote. But in any case, the evidence was that this is a national movement advocating for the elimination of sexual orientation and gender identity uh, curriculum in schools, as well as mixed bathrooms, that sort of stuff, right? So whether, now that's a, really a policy disagreement, as far as I can tell. You want certain information, certain curriculum uh, um, content removed. And that, that seems like a perfectly reasonable <laughs> position to take. Whether or yep. not you agree with it, that is a, a policy position. And he is called, and he just said, that's evidence for hate. And Trustee Watson pushed him on this and said, well, how, these are just parents. I, I don't know how you can call that hateful. You know, they're just, they, they don't believe they're hateful. They're just want the best for their kids. And this is what they're, they're, mar no one's listening to them. So they're protesting. <laughs> um, and he said, well, I've made my statement. That's evidence. So, so I'm just, I mean, to me, that's just completely ridiculous. Um, so this article, I just wanted to respond to each of the things, and it's quite long <laughs> because mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to make sure that I addressed all sorts of things in this article. Yeah, this is a really compre comprehensive article indeed. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really what I find with the Waterloo District School Board leadership, including the director in this, they, they really dug themselves in a trench of what I deem to be unacceptable behavior. You know, like all this Soji thing, which is sexual orientation, gender identity curriculum that they say, on the one hand, they say, you know, we have a curriculum from the Ministry of Education, you know, and we're following that. But on the other hand, this Soji stuff is, is not approved and it's completely intertwined. And the school, I've calculated, they spend about 30% of the time celebrating sexual days. That's, that includes like a, a full month of LGBTQ, which is Pride Month. Then you got a full month of uh, LGBTQ history. Then you have like Bisexual uh, Visibility Day, Trans Awareness Week, etc. And all of these, so the students are getting at a minimum 30% of their time in school celebrating sexual behaviors. And what this leads to in this belief um, is because they have it written down in their procedures that students can self-ID, you know, boys can go into girls' change rooms and washrooms. And I think this is completely unacceptable. And I think the position of parents to want to eliminate uh, the promotion of talking, conversing about the sexual behaviors of minors and what they prefer and to eliminate uh, minors uh, being boys going into girls change rooms and washrooms and participating in the sports I think that's a completely reasonable um, position to have and this letter that you have you know if parents are not happy about this and they're going out to protest um, find it interesting that he doubles down so you what you recommend both of these articles uh kind of lead to one thing and that is the resignation of the director do you think uh he's earned his resignation at this point what do you think well based on on this alone um i just think i don't know how it's tenable for a director of education to attack parents and citizens on a topic where I cite an Angus Reid poll in there, you know, for example, with respect to the procedure AP1235 that um, says that parents don't necessarily need to be informed of any sort of gender identity changes, these psychosocial interventions at school that are unproven, untested. Um, I think it's, in, it's 80 plus percent of Canadians think no parents should be informed. I mean, this is just overwhelming, right? So, so based on 
a policy disagreement that you're taking the very unpopular position here and then based on that disagreement you're labeling people hateful this i mean <laughs> it's not nice to be called hateful especially in a society where i mean i think it's maybe easing up a little bit now i mean the government's still pushing the hate agenda but people are kind of now at this point saying oh called racist or homophobic or transphobic again it just doesn't mean anything anymore um so but i think if if you're now still doing this trying to push trying to slander and defame people with dishonest accusations you are unfit for public office you do not deserve to be there and especially a director of education that takes such an unethical position they they just i i don't know how anyone can accept this he needs to resign there's no other way to say this i don't know how we can we can uh continue to accept this sort of yeah it's defamatory uh it's unworthy of a director of education or any public official yeah i completely agree you know he, in my opinion you know statements like these and just overall dramatic statements manipulative statements um, I think he he should resign immediately. I think it's embarrassing on behalf of the school board. I think it's embarrassing for him to make these kind of statements. Obviously, he can't back anything up. He gets called out on it time and time again. Uh, the director is a reflection of the leadership, of the trustees as well, because the trustees uh, hired him to represent their views as well. And either than uh, the three trustees that we have, which is Cindy Watson, uh, Mike Ramsey, and Bill Cody, uh, the other eight trustees, you know, they're all in alignment with the director. So I really think, you know, if you read the book, I, I recommend uh, the listeners and the viewers look at the book, The Marxification of Education by Dr. James Lindsay. And you're going to get to know a little bit about what is happening in education and uh, why these things that you're seeing don't really make sense and why there isn't uh, any emphasis put on academic achievement. And, you know, if a, if you have a director that's obviously, it, to me, he seems completely unstable and unable to make any rational, uh, any rational arguments, which why he refers to these, uh, uh, I would say, dismissive arguments when you say hateful or bigots or phobics or etc these are not arguments these are just dismissing and trying to belittle the opinion of others um you know that's not working anymore so i completely agree i will be linking this article as well for anybody listening uh in the description and jeff i just wanted to to thank you so much for putting the time once again and uh and taking the time just to find out the information and to write these comprehensive articles. Well, it's my pleasure, David, and thank you for bringing attention to them and all the work you do. Absolutely, and to anybody that wants more information, I highly recommend you subscribe to the Empower Substack. Uh, like I said, we have some incredible articles uh, coming out, and you know, Dr. Jeff Horseman, he's he's a uh, quite the quite the knowledge database on this stuff and he seems to look into it so if you like to keep up to date with what's happening in the waterloo region and also by the way this stuff is also applicable across canada because other school boards are suffering from the same thing you can learn a lot from these articles as well and you can learn a lot from uh jeff's analysis in this so i highly recommend and uh yeah I'm going to put the link to the articles and to the Empowered Substack for you to subscribe. I really hope that you enjoyed this episode as well. Until next time, take care.